In this video, I am going to talk about MOS diode versus MOSFET, especially in terms of CV characteristics. This is in fact an explanation to the question that we actually asked. That was, if MOS diode was having inversion only in low frequency, which is in 10 Hz or so, how is MOSFET going to work in 3 GHz kind of processors? To start with, let me take a MOS diode in which the CV characteristics were like this, in which this curve was for low frequency and this curve was for high frequency. Now let me just summarize what was the reason why this curve was not coming at uh, higher frequencies like in gigahertz. In this ideal MOS, when the voltage VGB is zero, we assume to be having a flat band condition this is when VGB is equal to zero for an ideal MOS diode under equilibrium where we had flat band condition that is semiconductor energy bands were flat. In inversion, the energy band diagram was like this where the energy bands were bent in this fashion where we had the electric field in this direction and we had lots of electrons present near the silicon dioxide silicon interface. We call this the inversion condition. Here we got the inversion charge in equilibrium because of thermal generation due to which there were electron hole pairs generated and the present electric field separated the electrons and holes. Electrons were pulled towards the silicon dioxide silicon interface. And under equilibrium, the n times p was equal to n a square reached. Once that happens, it reaches equilibrium. Then we had the inversion charge. But at higher frequencies of operation, this entire process takes time. So we wouldn't get the inversion charge to accommodate the change of voltage across the MOS diode or MOS capacitor. Hence, we got at high frequency a CV characteristics where we didn't actually have the inversion charge coming in. Let's look at what happens in a MOSFET compared to this MOS diode. Let me take a MOSFET structure here. To understand MOSFET's behavior in comparison to MOS capacitor or MOS diode, I need to make this also a two terminal structure. So I am shorting the source to the bulk and even the drain to the bulk so that it becomes a two terminal structure now where we have only G and this terminal. It looks like a two terminal structure. Now let's see what happens in this structure at low frequencies and high frequencies. Now under equilibrium, let's say when VG is also zero, let's see the energy band diagrams in this case. Of course, when I draw from this direction, that is gate, oxide and semiconductor this way, the energy band diagram would look like this and when we take the energy band diagram in this direction this way let me say this line I'm drawing it very close to the surface just to show you clearly I haven't drawn it close but let's say it is drawn very close to the surface the energy band diagram there would look like this this region is the source region where we have n type semiconductor n type semiconductor where EF is close to EC and when we come to this region it is a P type semiconductor we have this where Fermi energy level is close to EV and when we go to the drain side this is N plus so the EF is close to EC and of course we see a barrier from N plus to P side which is expected that is a PN junction and even here also drain to the substrate that's why we have these barriers this is under equilibrium when Vg is also zero. Now let's say as we are increasing the potential at gate and we enter into inversion, let's see how the carriers are going to come into this channel region. So this is how the energy band diagram would look in inversion case. But the question is, how did we get these electrons near the surface? Is it with the same mechanism or a different one? So let's investigate from this figure when we increase the potential at gate, the energy band diagram in the substrate at the silicon dioxide silicon interface bends 
which means this entire energy band here would go down as we are drawing this energy band diagram near the surface. So when gate potential is increased, this energy band would go down, reducing the barrier between this N plus to P substrate and from drain side also N plus to P substrate. This is how it looks. Now if you observe from this to here that this was the Fermi potential and here the EI has gone down below this EF because the entire energy band here has gone down. We get here the Q times phi F. In fact, this is Q times because we are talking about electron volts, the electron energy here. As we increase the gate potential, this energy band would come down. When it comes down, this N plus source and drain regions are reservoirs of plenty of electrons, which means when this band comes down, there will be plenty of electrons present here which would come into this region because the barrier has lowered, which would in turn create the channel. In this case, in MOSFET case, we are not depending on this process, which is in fact slow when we apply frequencies. As a result, when we look at this, the CV characteristics for a MOSFET when used like a MOS diode, Frequency range for MOS capacitor was in 10 hertz, 20 hertz kind of, but in case of MOSFET, it would be in terms of gigahertz. So let me write this here. Low frequency would be in 10 hertz kind of, whereas in MOSFET, it would be in terms of gigahertz. This is for the MOSFET case and this is for the MOS diode case. Now this explains why MOS capacitor cannot have a inversion at gigahertz frequencies, but MOSFET when used as a MOS diode can actually have characteristics or inversion characteristics at gigahertz range where now we have all the silicon chips operating in microprocessors or SOCs working at gigahertz.